Well, we're going to just get going right away. I just want to say welcome to the White House. I can't think of a more exciting time for us. I still remember, I am mortified to say, vividly, 39 years ago, being spellbound for every single episode. And the fact that we're here in this White House celebrating a remake with all of you just doesn't get much better than that. So now I'm going to actually turn the tables and go from being the person who's used to being the interviewer to being the interviewee. So here you go. Come on up, Malachi. Come on up. Can y'all hear me? Forgive me if this uh, day becomes slightly emotional for me. Um, being here in this house at this particular time in history, Mario and Malachi and I were speaking just off stage. This is a moment. Philip Noyce is here, the director of Night One. Good to see you, Philip. The person that I'm about to introduce to you all, oh, for those of you who don't know, I played the Kunta Kinte in the original uh, 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 of, of Roots. Um. I told LeVar we look just the same as we did back then. We haven't changed one bit. And I am uh, exceedingly proud to say that I am a co-executive producer of, of this new version, this new vision of Roots, and um, I'm excited for you all to see um, what we have, uh, have wrought. Um, before we get started, Mark Wolper, the David Wolper's son and the executive producer of Roots is in the house, and please uh, put your hands together for him. Mark, just stand up so people can see you. It is Mark's tireless efforts that have brought this saga to the screen. And so this morning, I get the extreme and joyous pleasure of having a conversation with Valerie Jarrett. For those of you um, who are from Washington, D.C., she needs no introduction. I will do a little, if you don't mind, uh, by the way of introduction in any case, um, because you are indeed one of the most powerful figures in politics. She is a senior advisor to the president and is the director of White House, the White House Office of Public Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs. What does that mean? It's a long story. Okay. We are the gateway by which uh, the American people and state and local elected officials come and engage uh, and represent their interests so that we make sure that we're actually doing the people's work. The people's so business. We listen, we engage, and we uh, encourage the American people to participate in this in the most important office of all, and that's the Office of Citizenship. Absolutely. You're also the, the director of the White House Office uh, on Women and Girls. Um, her life and her work are, are a testament to her passion for equality. The, the fact that you are in the position that you are in is, uh, comes as no surprise, and we will get into it in a moment, but genetically, and I believe that we are all genetically predisposed to do that which it is we do, to bring the gift that we have to bring. And, and you are, are a real amazing example of that. Uh, Valerie, her great-grandfather, Robert Robinson Taylor, was accepted at MIT, becoming its first black graduate, making him the first professionally trained black architect in our nation. Booker T. Washington hired him to design and expand the campus of Tuskegee Institute, right? And it is your grandfather, Robert Rashawn Taylor, who was a distinguished civic leader in Chicago. He became the first African-American chairman of the Chicago Housing Authority. Your mother, Barbara Taylor Bowman, widely respected expert in early childhood development and is the founder of the Erickson Institute. Your father, Dr. James E. Bowman, a world-renowned pathologist and geneticist and was the first African-American resident at St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago. Henry Louis Gates, said in um, an editorial to the New York Times that Miss Jarrett descends from one of the most distinguished family trees in African American history. It is difficult, he says, for me to recall a black family tree with more firsts in African American history. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Valerie Jarrett. Wow. Wow. 
You can introduce me everywhere I go from now on. <laughs> Whose idea was this? This was a really good idea. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> so uh, Roots is about the passing on of traditions and the essence of who we are from one generation to another. Tell us about your mother and father and what it was like growing up uh, as their daughter. You are not an only child. I am an only you child. You are an only child. I am an only child. Um, my childhood started with me being born in Iran, which is a little unusual for African Americans. We lived there until I was five. We moved to um, London for a year, and then my father uh, joined the faculty of the University of Chicago Medical Center, uh, a job that he is sure he would not have been able to get when he first left the country in about 1952 from the Army. So when he came out of the Army, he was looking for jobs, and he decided he couldn't really get the same pay as his white counterparts here, and so they decided to go far afield, and far afield they did. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was an interesting experience to have as a child, and then to, to come home and speak three languages, one of which no one had ever heard of before. Farsi. Farsi, mm -hmm. and uh, start out in public school in Chicago. Yeah, that was more than a notion. How many kids <laughs> in, in a Chicago public school spoke Farsi? Not a lot, and back then I always kind of joked that the first part of my life I was trying to explain to people where Iran was because no one had heard of it. And I spent the next hour of my life saying, yes, but it had very different leadership when I was there than it does now, so don't hold that against me. Mm -hmm. And your mom? And my mom, she was, uh, my mom was born in Chicago. My dad was born here in Washington, D.C. And uh, she has had a lifelong passion for early childhood education and worked hard to ensure every child has quality um, affordable early childhood education and she now at the age of 87 continues to teach full-time wow. graduate school in the school that she founded Erickson Institute I know. so we, we we mentioned a little bit about the Taylor side of your family but the Rashon side of your family is equally illustrious right um, your one of your great-great-grandfathers was one of the first African-American legislators in Louisiana. Um, tell us that story. And all of this, did you have knowledge of this growing up, or was this all as a result of, of the Finding Your Roots episode that you did with, with Skip Gates? I had knowledge of a fair amount of my um, ancestry, going back to my great-great-grandfather, who was in the uh, Louisiana State Legislature. My aunt and uncle had a um, certificate of his oath of office hanging in their living room, so I knew that, and I knew um, um, a fair amount about my great-grandfather who attended MIT, but I think we have a little prop that Skip prepared for me, which I'll show you all, um, much of which I did not know. This is my family tree. Thank you for holding up, Stephanie. And so it shows you, here I am down here, and so I can trace back 11 generations um, on my grandfather's side, on one grandfather's side, seven on another, and on my dad's side of the family, five generations. Uh, but telling enough, none of these go back to Africa, because obviously that's a huge void. Uh, but thank you, thank you, Stephanie. She agreed to be my Vanna White. <laughs> 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 but uh, in terms, what I find most uh, compelling about my great-grandfather who attended MIT was the fact that his son um, was born a slave. And his uh, apparent father, we believe, was his master, his slave owner, who freed him and allowed him, even when he was a slave, to work. And he was a construction, uh, he was in contracting. And so he worked as a slave and then was freed and made enough money to send his son to MIT. So from one generation to being a, born into slavery to having your son go to MIT is... That's an unusual story for people of color Pretty in this extraordinary country. story. Yeah. I just, I think oftentimes about what that must have been like getting on a train from North Carolina and heading up to Massachusetts and what a world apart it must have been. And to have been the only one. And to have been the only one. Right. To have been the only one, yeah. Very cool. Your, your ancestor, who was a legislator, is, is uh, responsible for initiating a, 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 um, a course of action that had significant impact on our country. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the story that, that Skip discovered, and I didn't know the details of this. Skip, as you all may know, as he does his Roots series, does an incredible amount of 
research into your family tree in addition to doing the DNA test, which we can get to a bit later. But the research, um, disco he discovered a transcript that um, my uh, great-great-grandfather gave on the floor of the legislature where he, made the, he was making the case for integrating trail ca train cars, rail cars. And he said, here I am, uh, your colleague, duly elected representative, and I'm not allowed to travel in the same train car with your families, but your maid mm -hmm. can. How is that right? I should be able to travel as freely as you. We're both elected representatives. And so he really, I can't even again imagine what that must have been like standing on the floor and making what was a very compelling case for integrating our rail system. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of that case? Not so good in the first instance. Got mm -hmm. better with time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which led to Plessy versus Ferguson, and which is, of, of course, a landmark uh, case that was heard by the Supreme Court. So ruling that separate but equal is fine, right. which of course we know it's not fine. Right. So your family was there um, at a very crucial time in the formation of the identity of this nation. And now here you are um, in this now moment in time, um, a very instrumental person in this current administration. Um, so as I said before, there is a genetic imprint that we all carry with us that sets the course for who we are, why we are here, and what our contribution is going to be. That is why our genetic code is so important. That is why bloodlines and the mixing of bloodlines favor so prominently into the mix, the literal mix of how societies are formed and those who rise to the level that they do to make those significant contributions, those are not by happenstance. That there is indeed some very specific, mysterious yes, but very specific design going on. Wouldn't you agree? I know I stand on pretty strong and sturdy shoulders right. and um, have had enormous opportunities in life because of the work ethic of my parents and their commitment to education and supporting me, which is what they learned from their parents and their grandparents and on back. And so being cognizant of that uh, makes me uh, strongly believe to those who much is given, much is expected. Amen. And you have a daughter? I do. I hope we were going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a delicious, can't conceivably be 30-year-old daughter. Uh, who lives in Chicago, practices law at a law firm, uh, is married, and uh, just the absolute joy of my life. Yes, and, and she is uh, in the practice of law. She is, she is. She's with a law firm, something I told her not to ever do, but she obviously charted her own path. Um, I worked at a law firm for a number of years and uh, woke up miserable one day. Well, maybe it wasn't just one day. It was a gradual stream towards being miserable, and that's what encouraged me to take a leap of faith and join mm. the public service. Right, right. And so um, she is aware of, of her lineage uh, and the history of, of the family into which she has been born. Um, has she inherited this, uh, this family gene for public service? I think, I, I think absolutely. And I don't know what path it will take, whether it's full-time, part-time. I mean, what's so incredible about public service is that each one of us can find our own way. And it's, again, back to being a citizen. Right. And how you manifest it is up to you. But I think it'd be hard to be in our family and not feel a responsibility to give back to this country that has provided us incredible opportunity. And she's had a chance to have a role model both in myself and my, grandma, my mother, my grandmother. Um, and, but I will say one thing when you talk about um, what Skip did for us, it was an incredible gift because I had no idea of the details of our lineage. And he discovered we have cousins in Skipney, Ireland, and that another part of my family came from right outside of Normandy. And it was such a, it gives you such a sense of self mm -hmm. and where you fit. Right. And I think all too often, African Americans who don't have the ability to chart back to people and to places are stripped of that right. as a result of slavery. Right. Um, and I don't know any of my African ancestries, but I do know as a result of the DNA test that um, the 
the country in Africa where the lion's share of my ancestry comes from uh, is Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea. And so now I was like, those are my peeps, right? right? Absolutely. <laughs> It gives you a different perspective on the country once you know something like it, that. It absolutely does. I've, I've recently undergone the, the, the 23 and Me process yes. and yeah, provided yeah. a DNA sample, and, and I was shocked to discover that fully 25% of my genetic code is of English and Irish ancestry. I uh, told you that. Yes. <laughs> it shows, doesn't it? It does show. It means something. Well, so now, are you ready for me to yeah, turn the tables a sure, little bit on you? Sure. So you play what, uh, in our generation, Kunte Kinte is a household name. There isn't a person my age, right, who didn't grow up knowing that name. It's a name you'll never forget. And given the historical significance, not just for African Americans, but for every American, tell us um, what it was like for you to play that role, and how did that tie into your own sense of place and history? Mm. That is a, that's a, a, a great question. Roots was, Roots was not simply my first job, it was my first professional audition. Um, so uh, to say that it that's has... That's incredible right there, right? <laughs> talk about destiny and, 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 um, and being um, selected, being chosen for a very specific purpose, a very specific task. Um, Roots has for many reasons, shaped both my life and my career. It was um, as a result of Roots and having been in Roots that I was shown really the power, the potential power of the medium of television. In eight consecutive nights, Roots transformed this nation around its idea of what we mean when we talk about slavery. And it was done through an entertainment vehicle. So I learned at the age of 19 that television could do more than simply entertain, that it could enlighten, it could inform, it could uplift if used appropriately. My mother and is, was an English teacher and had a second career as a social worker, and so she is responsible for imprinting um, in her line uh, and, has, and, and has given birth to a family of teachers. All the women on my mother's side of the family are teachers and social workers. My father um, was a soldier and all the men on my father's side of the family tend to be soldiers and or ministers. Um, he's had careers as both. And so I studied for the priesthood earlier in my life. I was not going in the army. That was not... Uh, <laughs> the army or the priesthood, those were your choices. <laughs> those were those <laughs> so I, I chose what seemed to be the, the wiser course of study. Um, and, and having discovered that it was possible to do more than entertain um, in show business gave me permission to pursue uh, projects that gave me an opportunity to do just that. So um, I, am, I, I am, like you, an in, the inheritor of uh, a genetic line that has led me to do what it is I do. And I think that we all have that in common. If you look at who you are and where you come from, there are clues that are laid in our path that help us discover what our destinies are. And so when you said eight, it's so interesting because I would have thought it was 20 episodes. If you mm. were to have asked me, I thought it just mm. went on forever. And I will say to the younger people in the room, we looked forward to it coming on because if you didn't see it that night, you couldn't just like record it right. and look at it another night. So the world stopped. Yeah. It the did. world literally stopped. Yeah. How, long, how long was it before reruns came on? It, before, was, it was a couple of years before we had a chance imagine, to see it again. Yeah. To you young people here, can you imagine having to wait more than five minutes or you know, the next day when it's on demand? Yeah. And so the world stopped when we watched it. With whom did you watch it? I watched the first night uh, alone um, in my apartment. By design? Uh, yes. Uh, I had seen it once. I had been here to Washington, D.C., I think to the Gambian Embassy, to see a screening. And that was the first time I saw it. But I was so overwhelmed with the setting and, and everything, I really wasn't able to pay much 
or close attention. So I watched night one by myself in my apartment near USC, and then I drove to Sacramento uh, to watch night two with my mom and family and friends. And what, were, what was your mother and the rest of your family's reaction to this? And did it open up stories that you hadn't heard yet about your family? It, it, a, a little. Um, first, let me say that, that uh, Alex Haley, who was, in my opinion, the, the most consummate storyteller I have ever encountered in my life. Um, came to me one when we were on location in Savannah, Georgia, and he said to me, you know, I, I, I know that you can't afford it. You're a student on scholarship um, in college. And this is a really important event that I believe your mother should be a part of. And so Alex sent my mother, Irma Jean Christian, a ticket to, to come to Savannah, Georgia, to be on the set of Roots during the filming. Yeah, uh, that's how, I, Alex Haley was not, he, he is, in my opinion, was a great man. Not simply a great storyteller, um, a great author, Pulitzer Prize winning author, he was a great man. Alex had that unique ability to, when you were in conversation with him, he was able to focus exclusively on you. You never got the sense that Alex was looking over your shoulder to see who came in the room that was perhaps more important. Um, he was laser locked on you, and that's an extraordinary quality to have in a human being, especially one as popular as he was. Um, so Alex, in, in my view, is, is, is a great, it was a great human being. Um, the, the idea that he had taken that interest in my family and, um, and that we were experiencing as a family his family's story really m has made my family for the last 40 years feel very much a part of the Haley family. When I went to Jufere for the first time, I was embraced as a member of the Kente clan. And I know that for my mother and for my sisters and my cousins, we all feel very connected to the family of Kunta Kente. Um, and so the, the experience of watching that with family and friends was extraordinary. And none of us really understood on that night what was about to happen in America and in our lives. Um, the morning after night two, I went into the grocery store on errands for my mother, and, um, and there I was on the cover of TV Guide and was recognized for the first time. And literally from that day till this, my life has not been the same. Wow. All right, so I have a question. Favorite scene you were in or were not in mm. for the series? <sighs> Well, I'm partial to the naming sequences. Mm -hmm. Holding a child up to the night sky and... I cried when that happened. Yeah. Um, I mean, literally cry. Yeah. That, is a, that is a favorite scene. And, and when I flew to South Africa to, uh, to visit the set, I happened to arrive on set when that scene was being shot. Uh, and as you will see later on, this time on horseback, because what we know now is that the Mandinka were not simply warriors, they were a horse warrior culture. There's been a lot more scholarship done in the intervening years, mostly as a result of the success of the miniseries, the original miniseries, that enables us to know more now than we did when Alex was doing the original research. So walking onto the set and, and being present for, for that particular moment in night one was pretty extraordinary. Um, and then there's the, the whipping scene, um, which for me, really helps crystallize who the character of Kunta Kinte is and, and why his story is so powerful. The, the idea that being whipped physically into submission was not enough to change his mind about who he is and what his value was as a man. Um, it really does embody what, what Roots is all about in the character of Kunta Kinte. And it's timeless. And so, what are your thoughts about the remake? Honestly? Yeah. No, just, yeah. <laughs> and well, it's just between, you know, just you Just between and the me. two of us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be my new profession. I like this. <laughs> so, yeah, tell us what's going to happen. Well, I'll, 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 I'll tell you true. I, I did not expect that this would ever be done, a remake of Roots. Um, 
in many ways I did not believe it ever should be done. Um, and when I first heard about it, I was, um, how you say, um, less than enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, and then I got a call from Mark Wolper, who shared with me his story, in that he had sat his children down to watch the original, their grandfather's seminal work. And watch they did, but it was a struggle for them. Not necessarily because of the difficulty of the material, but as, as Mark's son, who was 16, I think, at the time, um, said, he said, at the end, he said, Dad, I get why this is important, but it's a lot like your music. It doesn't really speak to me. And Wow. Right? Ouch. Yeah. Are and you sure that our music doesn't speak to you? I think it does. <laughs> I actually think it does. <laughs> well, I know my music doesn't necessarily speak to my 21-year-old. Um, she'll tolerate it being on, but given her druthers, she'd much rather listen to hers. It was in Mark telling me that story that I got immediately the value of needing to make this for a new generation, and that if we were to share this story with the new generation, we were going to have to make it relevant to them. We were going to have to make sure that it had meaning um, for them. And I have to admit that, you know, as attached emotionally as I am to the original, when I go back and watch it, there are aspects of it that do indeed feel dated. We live in a much faster paced world today. And our storytelling 40 years ago was at a different pace as well. We live in a very kinetic society these days, and, and our storytelling has kept a pace with the pace at which we live. And so the, the, the casting, um, Mark's father did a, an amazing and a remarkable thing. He had all of America's favorite TV dads, the white ones, play villains in Roots. Lauren Green from right? From Bonanza, Bonanza, right? Robert Reed from the Brady Bunch. There was Lloyd Bridges. There was um, Chuck Connors, the dad on The Rifleman. All, Ed Asner, all of America's favorite TV dads were villains in Roots. And those names don't mean anything to this current generation. That's fascinating. Right? It is, because I didn't even think about the fact that all our favorite people were horrendous people. I just knew I recognized them. <laughs> I recognized them, right? But you're right, this crew wouldn't recognize them. So having forced Whitaker and Lawrence Fishburne, Anika Noni Rose, Anna Paquin, Jonathan Reese Myers, right? Having Mackay Pfeiffer, Derek Luke, in our production, it makes a difference. It means, they mean something to this generation, and that will help make this relevant to them in their lives. But at the same time, I'm sure that you must have given Malachi some advice on how to play this role. M He's listening, so you better, <laughs> you better tell us the truth or I'm gonna look for his expression and know you're not. <laughs> as, as you will see a little later on this morning, Malachi needed no advice <laughs> from me. Um, my, my wish, my prayer for Malachi was that he really feel comfortable interpreting this character through his own lens, and that was, uh, that was already his mindset. Um, while we are on the subject, I am so excited for you all to see Malachi's version of Kunta Kinte. I, I've, I've shared with him before, when, when I did Roots, I was 19, um, and it was, it was, as I said, my first job. Malachi is 26 and has the unenviable job of playing Kunta throughout the entire course of the character in the miniseries. I shared the role with, with John Amos. I played him in hours one through four, and then John Amos, an older actor, took over. So I was, um, I was a kid. Malachi is 26. There is a plaque in my living room that was presented to me by Stan Margulies, the producer of Roots, that has affixed to it the chains that I wore on my ankles in Roots. Um, and th there was a, a, a thick 
foam pad that was scraped out during the middle of the filming of the escape sequence because my, my ankles were swollen to the point where I, we could no longer affix the shackles without scraping that pad out. And at the end of the production, Stan presented this plaque to me and there's a silver little dedication uh, on, on the plaque that says to a mighty child. At one point, Fiddler calls Kunta a mighty child. And I've shared with Malachi that when I did the role of Kunta, I was a mighty child. Malachi is a mighty man in the expression of this character. And therein lies the difference. In a sense, that comment is really about what roots are all about, which is each generation allowing the next generation to find their own way. Uh, he watched the original series. He study it, studied it, no doubt. He did his research. Uh, he learned what he could, but now he has the opportunity to shape it his own way. And that's what each generation is supposed to do, which is such a perfect way to close. So thank you so much for sharing your story. and for Thank you for sharing yours. Yeah. It's a pleasure. And now we're going to start uh, with our panel discussions. Stephanie, are you coming back up? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you to LeVar and to Valerie for that riveting conversation. I'd like to bring up Joshua. Dubois. I also want to quickly thank our um, partners who helped to pull all this together, the A&E team and the History Channel team. Thank you all so much. Please give, her, please give that whole team a round of applause. Okay. Yep, all set. Right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for all your tremendous work bringing us together. My name is Joshua Dubois. I'm the CEO of Values Partnerships and used to spend some good time in this place as well. And it's such an honor to be here on this very special day. Friends, I, I, let's just take a step back and, and consider what just happened and what's going to happen today. We just had the senior advisor for the first African-American president, who happens to be wrapping up his terms, tier, by the way, um, interview Kunta Kinte from the original Roots at this moment when a new Roots is being reimagined. How special is that? Um, let's give Valerie and LeVar another round of applause. We're gonna, gonna move into our panel in just a bit, um, but I wanna just give you a, a few facts and figures that you should know. So the reimagination of Roots airs on history, on the History Channel, beginning on Memorial Day, May 30th, for four nights in a row. So history, four nights in a row, uh, beginning on May 30th, and the entire nation is going to be watching. A phenomenal team came together to put this together, including uh, Mark Wolper, the son of David Wolper, who produced the original, um, and some phenomenal folks that you're gonna see on panels later uh, today and you see in, in the room. If you don't mind, I'd love to just have everyone from the cast, crew, or A plus C, or history, that, um, or sponsors that are here today, just stand up so we could acknowledge you and the great work that you've done, please, if you wouldn't mind. Coming up. <laughs> all our history, Lynn Feeney, all you <laughs> thank you so much. Tremendous work. Um, we're, we're going to play a, a brief um, uh, clip and uh, then head into a conversation about identity. Your name is your shield and um, what it means to ask the questions about who we really are. But let's, uh, let's play a, another brief uh, sneak preview from Roots. I think we're going to reset the stage for our panel as folks are, are doing that. Um, you know, Valerie and LeVar, they, they work in different spaces, um, but they, they share a common passion, and that's creating sp spaces for people to live lives of dignity and self-determination and really, at, at root, understand who they really are. And that's what this next panel is all about. Um, when Roots premiered in 1977, it provoked both a public conversation, but it also provoked a lot of introspection as well. For, for millions of Americans, they went inward 
And for the first time, they thought critically about their family histories, their stories, their, their lineage. Is that the case for anyone in the room by chance? Did Absolutely, we see some hands. Roots um, uh, encourage people to go deeper into their own stories. Now, the 2016 Roots hasn't even premiered yet, but the rumbles of conversations are already occurring around the country for a new generation and for folks who experienced the first Roots. Um, as the trailer gets shared on social media and as A plus E and history host forums around the country, people are asking that question again. Who am I, really? Where did I come from? What country? What coast? What community? What set of ideas? Who am I? That, that journey of exploration, provoked for a lot of people by roots, might be the most important journey any of us will ever be on. Because when we find those answers, when we, when we find our specific family lineage, but also the answers of how we see ourselves, that's incorporated from that point forward into the way that we live our lives. It shapes and sort of extends a, our sense of what's possible for us. So, so the questions this panel are going to answer is, why is it important for people to know their roots? And how, in advance of this premiere of the new imagination of roots, are people finding their roots today? And I think we do have some chairs at some point coming out for, <laughs> it's all good. Thank you, Scott. While they're doing that, let me re remind you um, that if you're connected to the internet now, please feel free to tweet and share throughout the day, hashtag roots, and uh, let everyone know that you're here um, and, and participate in the conversation online as well. Thank you. I think we just need four. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, um, so to, to answer that question about who we really are, we, we have um, some outstanding panelists. Um, let me welcome them to the stage. Lovey and Alondra, Joanna Mountain and DeRay. Let's welcome them to the stage. Yeah, um, any order is fine. So with over 500,000 readers a month at her enormously popular blog, awesomelylovey.com, Lovey Ajayi is a go-to source for smart takes on popular culture. She's one of the country's most influential millennials and has been lauded by everyone from Shonda Rhimes to Oprah Winfrey and a whole bunch of other folks um, for driving the pop culture conversation. Sorry about that. We can switch this. And you can go right there, Joanna. You can take that seat right there. Oh, is there another one? Oh, okay, sorry, I thought there was one. <laughs> Let's all sing a song together. Just break up the, break it up a little bit. Spiritual or something. <laughs> all right, thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Let's give it up for Scott and Brandon who helped to set the stage. Thank you, guys. So back to Lovey. Lovey is amazing um, and has a wonderful online community that's one of the most influential in the country. 500,000 readers and growing. That's probably an old number. It's, it's even more than that now at awesomelylovey.com. Shonda Rhimes retweets her all the time. Oprah invited her to her house to hang out. And she's really been driving the pop culture conversation. Um, if, you, if you know about Scandal, it's probably uh, one reason is because Lovey was telling people about it. Um, in addition to all of that celebrity stuff, though, she also does tremendous work in uh, and, uh, philanthropy and a nonprofit. She's the co-founder of the Red Pump Project, a nonprofit that raises awareness about the impact of HIV/AIDS on women and girls. So let's welcome Lovey Ajay. Yeah. Dr. Alondra Nelson is the Dean of Social Science at Columbia University, and she's also one of the country's leading experts at a really interesting subject matter, the intersection of race and DNA. She's the author of several remarkable books, award-winning books, but uh, particularly the newly released book, and check out this title, The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome. Sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? Uh, let's welcome Dr. Alondra Nelson. And, and then on the end here, we have Dr. Joanna Mountain. She joined 23andMe. Anyone heard of 23andMe before? Absolutely. Um, 
uh, in 2007. And, and uh, Dr. Mountain is, is responsible for all of 23andMe's research projects, ensuring the protection of research participants and developing ancestry product offerings. She earned a PhD in genetics from Stanford. She's been awarded multiple grants from the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. Has co-authored over 50 papers and was also a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya and it, uh, is particularly focused on genetic diversity in Africa. So let's welcome Dr. Joanna Mountain. And finally, uh, DeRay McKesson um, is a wonderful leader for our time. He's one of the country's most recognizable and influential voices at the forefront of the movement for social change. His signature blue vest, I'm glad you're wearing it because I would have messed up my introduction if you weren't. His signature blue vest has been seen, you all have seen him from Ferguson to Baltimore on the front lines of some of the most uh, challenging issues we're facing as a country. And he's galvanized grassroots communities both offline and online um, around uh, issues related to police violence, um, and uh, other matters of community concern. DeRay is the former uh, Senior Director of Human Capital with Minneapolis Public Schools. He's also a Teach for America alum. Uh, he taught sixth grade math in New York City. Let's welcome DeRay. So, Lovey, we're going to start with you, my friend, and then we're going to ask a few questions and then go to the audience. Uh, you are the, one of the country's most influential uh, millennials, um, uh, but while you have your feet firmly planted in American culture, your identity as a Nigerian-American is also deeply important to you and informs your writing and your life. What was the process of discovering your own identity and being confident in it? Was, that, was it a decision to let both sides of your family shine through your work? And, and how has that decision impacted those who read you? I think we got a microphone. Okay. Oh. Geez. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I was born and raised in Nigeria. We um, moved to the U.S. when I was nine years old. And like I said, nobody told me we were moving. I mm -hmm. thought we were going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so when my mom enrolled me in school, I was like, "Wait, we're staying?" <laughs> so the first day of school, when I walked in in class, and the teacher makes me stand in front of the class and says, hey, we have a new girl in, in school, introduce yourself. In a split second, I had to make a decision of whether I'm introducing myself as a name I've been going by all my life, mm. my first name is Ifeolua, or whether I'm gonna give them the name that my aunt gives me, which is more palatable, and it's more of a nickname, Levette. So I was like, hi, I'm Levette. Had the strong Nigerian accent, and it was the first time I'd ever been the new girl anywhere because in Nigeria, I was comfortable. Um, the school I went to, our, it was, I went to a private school. The headmistress was my mom's best friend. I was never the new girl. Now I'm in this new place, cold weather, because it was October, and I had to like say who I was on the spot. So that moment, it kind of changed me, because for the first time standing out and being in this new space, I wasn't comfortable with it, and I had this strong accent. So what I did was I started mimicking how my classmates were speaking because this accent was just too strong. It, it othered me too much. So by sophomore year of high school, I lost most of my accent. Most people didn't even know what my first name actually was. First day of school, I'm going to my teacher and saying, hey, don't call me that, call me this because I don't want the students to kind of look at me funny. It was probably when I got to college, that I kind of reclaimed it because I started seeing proud African students around. For me, it had just been something that had made me stand out in the worst way. And the jokes about my accent, the jokes about where I'm from, the jokes about the food I was bringing to school. I wasn't bringing sandwiches. I was bringing like jollof rice, <laughs> like on the first day of school. So just seeing people who kind of had the same background as me still standing strong and it inspired me to do the same. And by the end of college, I was like VP of the African Cultural Association, super black, um, <laughs> super African, super Nigerian. Um, but it was, it was basically a journey. It wasn't a decision to finally like, yes, now I'm gonna be like a proud Nigerian. It was a journey of understanding that what I was thinking was othering me was actually something I had to be incredibly proud of. You know, when I told people what my name means, so I'm Lovey now, like professionally I go by Lovey. And Lovey came because my first name, Ifeolua, means God's love. So that love piece is what my family calls me. 
And that's the piece that I protect. And I use that as a protection for myself because if anybody calls me by that, they knew me at a time when none of this was happening. So for me, it is a shield. And I always um, talk about the importance of name and saying people's name correctly and actually respecting that because in Yoruba culture, our names are literally our shields. When you are born, the name that you are given has been given it to you based on the circumstance around your birth or how your parents feel like your life is gonna go. So for us, it's a path, it's a promise, it's kind of a dream for you. So when you are called, whatever you are called, it's a blessing. So the first time somebody speaks your name when you're born, it's actually blessed. So that way your whole life is blessed, so yeah. first though you had to see that pride modeled first by the people around you it makes me think you know how many people when they watch LeVar or when they will watch Malachi if, if they'll have that same sense of pride and that it will expand their own sense of possibilities when they see these men and women Anika and others on screen thank you so much lovey um, I want to move to Alondra next Dr. Alondra Nelson um, in, in your book, again, The Social Life of DNA, you talk about the connection between DNA and race, and you show how genetic genealogy can be a tool for addressing some of our most intractable problems in this country and the history that we will see in Roots on May 30th. Um, how, how are people using DNA to grapple with the unfinished business of slavery? Thanks. So that's the, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So that's the, the question um, that I spent 10 years exploring. I, I, I spent 10 years talking to African American genealogists and genetic genealogists about their experience and why they did it. And a lot of it really traces what Lovey was saying about this journey for identity. So like me, some of them were children when the original roots came on and sort of that left them with a yearning for what was this original name or what were these ties that had been broken um, and sets them on a journey. And you know, one of the amazing things about the, the Haley moment, about the Roots moment, is that it sets um, the expectation and the desire in several generations of African Americans to find these names, these shields, um, uh, but we didn't have the tools available to do it. And so you had generations, you know, you had now four decades uh, in which people had the model, Haley's really powerful model, without necessarily the way to do it. And then in the early 2000s, you have genetic ancestry testing, genetic genealogy, that really allows for the first time people who didn't have Haley's expertise or his time, um, his expertise as a researcher to begin for their own selves to answer this question and to make this journey about identity that I think all, you know, all human beings share, but people of African descent in a particular way to make that sort of um, uh, more possible. So I found lots of interesting things. I mean, we, you won't be surprised to hear that I met people who were very moved by the information that they were able to uh, get about their genetic ancestry testing. But what I found that surprised me in doing the research is that it wasn't only about the personal identity questions. It was really that people were using genetic ancestry testing as a vehicle to answer these bigger questions about American society and about the legacy of racial slavery in American society. And so that meant that I would discover that in 2002, genetic ancestry testing would be introduced as evidence in a reparation suit for racial slavery in the United States, um, that I would participate in 2008 on the bank of the Ashley River in South Carolina in a ceremony called Asara that was um was led in part by the actor Isaiah Washington, who had used genetic ancestry testing to uncover uh, his matrilineal roots in Sierra Leone and participated in a Sierra Leonean ceremony to rest the souls of ancestors on the African continent and in the, in the, um, the Carolina Low Countries. And it also is used to create connection, people travel. And so to the extent that the unfinished business of slavery really is around conversations that we need to have as both families and a larger national and international community about that legacy. Genetic ancestry testing makes um, the history of slavery and the unfinished business of slavery not something that's abstract or in the past, but is about you and about me and about my great-great-grandmother and about your neighbor and about your cousin. It makes it much more concrete and it allows history to live in the present in ways that allow us to have still important questions and conversations. And are important questions and have conversations we need to have. 
exciting time that we're in that we're even able to do that. Yeah. And that brings me to Joanna. The, um, your company, 23andMe, gives people sort of the practical steps that they can take to, to live out um, the journey that Elantra is talking about. Um, tell us about the 23andMe process. If, and if you don't mind, so share with us how 23andMe's work is impacting the lives of African Americans and others who want to explore their roots related to race and slavery. Okay, here, here we go. So to answer that very complex question without writing a book like <laughs> Alondra did, um, I'll just, in my mind, I have a number of stories that I've heard from customers, people I know who've used the 23andMe test, and these stories fall into several categories. We have people who are able to confirm some aspects of their family history. They may have an understanding from you know, written records or family stories that they have Native American ancestry or ancestry from a particular place, and then it, sometimes that shows up in the DNA. Some people actually have a family mystery that they want to solve. They want to know, is somebody actually related to our family? It's, it's, it's all about connections. And so I know people who've solved those mysteries by finding, using the DNA to show, well, that person is actually a third cousin. Um, and you know, we never knew that before, and that means we're con our families are connected, and you know, we have common ancestors. So a fourth category is people who get surprises, and that happens quite often. In fact, um, my team and I published a paper last year all about, um, it's um, really a genetic portrait of the United States, looking at African Americans, European Americans, and Latinos, and the proportions of ancestry that for each of those groups across the United States that traces to um, Africa or Europe or Asia or the Americas. And we can see the patterns across the United States reflect migrations both into the United States and across the United States of peoples coming from all corners of the world. So a fourth category of story is where people just fill in the gaps. And this, the story I have in mind here is two individuals who figured out they were connected, one European American and one African American, who figured out they were related as cousins, and then the um, European American individual has a blank page at one, in one part of his family tree, and that page is completely filled in by the African American individual's family tree, who, who can trace her ancestry back to the individual in this other person's tree and thereby fill in, you know, both people are learning from the other person's research. And that's, this is a group effort. This understanding of our history is a group effort. And the DNA can really lead, lead people to connections with people who can help them. So it's not just the technical DNA piece, it's the social piece of people learning from one another. Come out to the audience Q and A after we asked Ray a question. But you, you mentioned surprises; just that it came to mind. I, I believe there was a really interesting connection between Lavar and someone. Was it Mark? Is it Mark? Sh share, Mark Walper, um, uh, executive producer of Roots. Share, share what you found out when you did your DNA test, real quick. Uh, we were asked to go on camera uh, when they uh, revealed our genetic code, and Lavar Burton, who play Cookie Kinte and the first roots that my father produced and Lavar and I have become friends and um, you know sort of brothers over time it was revealed to us that we are actually related. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the surprise categories. <laughs> I can see the resemblance. That's <laughs> that's great. That's pretty amazing, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But Duray, I want to come to you. You have been at the forefront of a new generation of young black folks and allies. Folks, some folks may call them the woke generation, people who are rediscovering their sense of self at, at, in new ways. I just coined that, write that down, woke generation. Um, <laughs> uh, how was your sense of identity strengthened through the process of protest, online and offline? Is the identity of a protester um, now a part of your roots, and if you want to share anything about your own roots as well, yeah. Yes, I think it's so. Hey. There we go. No. There we no, go. Here yeah. we go. Okay. 
So, so I identify as a protester. You know, I wore this vest every day in protest. Uh, these shoes are the shoes I got arrested in. There are no shoelaces because when you get arrested, they take your shoelaces out. Mm. And I wear them as a reminder of the struggle that so many of us went through. I think about Bree, who's here. Bree's here. You probably know Bree because she took down the flag. Uh, you know, wave, Bree. Bree's here. Yeah. I'm like, you know. Uh, Bree. The last time some of you saw Bree, she was on the top of the flagpole in South Carolina yeah, yeah, pulling down yeah, the yeah, Confederate Bree's, flag. Bree's so, yeah. family in the movement. And I'm mindful that so many of us put our bodies on the line. When I think about protest, I'm mindful to help people understand that it was not only those of us who took down the flag or stood in streets, but at its root, protest is this idea of telling the truth in public. And we use our bodies to tell the truth that Mike should be alive and Rakia should be alive and Ayana and Tamir should be alive. We take the flag down to tell the truth that that was a symbol of hate that encourages hate. We disrupted board meetings and commissions to tell the truth that people weren't using their institutional power in ways that valued the lives of marginalized people. And that is so much of what we did in the work and that's what we continue to do. When I think about this question of identity, we know that we did not discover injustice in August of 2014. We didn't invent resistance. and. Roots is a powerful reminder that we exist in a legacy of struggle and that we shouldn't, right? That like people should not, you know, I tell people, people get mad about the street shutdowns and they're like, DeRay, y'all sat, and, you know, we sat in parking lots and did a lot of stuff. Uh, and it's like, well, we shouldn't have to, right? We shouldn't have to protest. I don't want to protest. We had to do it because like the world was such that this was the only way for us to get our message out. We tried writing letters, we tried making phone calls, we went to the meetings that didn't work, we shut down traffic, everybody knows Mike Brown's name, right? And it was like, how do we extend the trauma for people that can choose not to be in proximity to the trauma? And that was so real for us. When I think about the online, offline, you know, online has been really powerful for us. I had 800 followers on Twitter, you know, two years ago, I have 300,000 now. I, about a, I get about 100 million impressions a month. And we have been able to do two things with technology. One is accelerate the pace of impact so we could organize quicker than the police could. So we could say, be at this corner right now, 2,000 people come, the police, you know, by the time the chopper's there, we've already shut down everything, um, which is really powerful. And the second is that we were actually able to build community. So we know people, I know Bree because when Bree climbed the flag, the video came and I can upload videos longer than 30 seconds. So I put the video on Twitter. I've ever taken so like that was my introduction to Bree and we knew each other on Twitter and now we you know now we're friends. Um, but we were able to build community through technology in ways that we could not before. And I think that's really powerful. You think about the 60s uh, is that people protested during the day, not because not necessarily because they were afraid of being out at night, but also because they had to take the tape reel to the news station for the nightly news. Whereas if there's a video right now, it can just be played live. And that's really powerful. I do worry though, people look at us and people look at us in Ferguson or Baltimore, specifically Ferguson though, and they think that we marched in the street because it was cool or we were marching in solidarity with the 60s. It was illegal to stand still in August of 2014 in St. Louis. Um, it was called the five second rule that if you stood still for more than five seconds, you were immediately arrested. And people forget that the trauma is actually still really close to us. Right. That that was August of 2014, which is a wild thing. Like it's wild to in the moment we were just so upset that we were like we're gonna be here forever. Um, but when I step back, I'm like it is wild that it was illegal to stand still. That's like a wild thing, and that wasn't too far away. So it is real for me. It's real for so many people that this idea of protest is. Again, how do we tell the truth in public spaces? How do we bring these conversations to spaces that will otherwise choose not to have them? identity of a protester of telling the truth in public is such a core part of who you are and really should be a part of what uh, most people, if not everyone, is. And that's, I think, something special about Roots. It's going to be a little bit of telling the truth in public, you know, with an exciting way, in a way that even if you're not concerned with um, deep social issues, you're still going to be able to enjoy the actual content. But then underneath the surface, it's telling the truth in public. A couple more questions, and we're going to go to the audience. Let, let me, um, DeRay talked about this notion of building a community of people online, even before they've met um, offline. Um, that's the case with a lot of the folks who follow you. I mean, and probably the case with yourself as well. You're from Nigeria and Chicago, but you're also a part of the Shondaland community for Thursday nights, right? Uh, and then, you know, people <laughs> that read you are from uh, LA or they're from New York or South Dakota, but now they're a part of Lovey's community. Is, is, are these online communities a part of people's identity today? Is that um, a part of their, their own roots and their own stories? Or should we really uh, push people to go deeper than that? Well, I mean, the power of technology is connecting to people. So even using me as an example, 2007, I've been on Facebook since 2004. I get a message from a friend of somebody out of the blue who's like, you remind me of my first ever best friend. 
turns out it was my first ever best friend who I hadn't talked to in 17 years since we left Nigeria. And we reconnected on Facebook. And the next time I went to Nigeria, she visited me and brought me some food. So, <laughs> jollof rice, of course. Um, <laughs> I think it's really powerful to use uh, community building like the internet and Facebook and blog comments to really create spaces that feel like home for people. Um, just if somebody was like me who lived in Nigeria, came here now today, they wouldn't necessarily feel the same othering that I did because right now people are wearing Ankara fabric dresses, people are wearing dashiki dresses to prom, right now being Afrocentric is in. So they wouldn't feel the same type of like, okay, I need to kind of hide who I am because right now we're trendy, which is also something I have a little problem with, but that's a different story. <laughs> but the internet allows people to see that they are part of a greater network of people who have the same background, the same love of food, the same love of language. And my audience seems to congregate around that. So example, somebody posted a piece on Twitter yesterday and said, um, Harriet Tubman would say, okay ladies, let's get off this plantation as opposed to formation. And my audience ends up creating a whole song based on what Harriet Tubman would say instead of formation. They, they called it liberation. But you don't know a lot about Beyonce, we'll come back to that later. I, <laughs> that's important. Beyonce. <laughs> One thirty about. <laughs> we'll do an unconference about Beyonce. Um, but it's just using the power of the internet to really get people's creativity around this one thing. But in terms of finding who they are, I've seen people who've told me, you know what, because of you talking about your background, I've researched it and I found out through 23andMe that I'm Nigerian, so we're cousins. So it's finding that common ground and finding that you can have cousins you've never met and you might have never even known you were connected genetically until you do and then you're like, well, now I can actually know more about Yoruba people because since I follow Lovey and she's always talking about her shady mama and her gele, it makes them feel a little bit more familiar. Fascinating how community is being created in, in new ways. Um, Alondra, uh, just to build on that a, a little bit, uh, what's, what are the prospects? You talked to, you've been doing this work for a long time. You talked about the impact of the 77 Roots. Where, how can we go deeper through uh, the mechanism of this new imagination of Roots? Where, where can this help push both African Americans and the broader country? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, one thing, um, I will say is that, you know, when I started doing the research, it wasn't clear to me that this was going to take off because we didn't, part of um, when genealogy takes off in the 1970s and late 70s, so we have um, the formation of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, you have lots of things happening in the genealogical space. And when genetic ancestry is introduced about 15 years ago in the United States, it wasn't clear that it was going to take off in the same way because we didn't have this really powerful visual narrative and uh, that came with it. Um, um, but what I think it proved is that genealogy of a, as a social practice is really about, um, I think, a response to these forms of historical amnesia. So that's actually helping us to try to answer these questions about the past that we are not able to answer, I think, or reckon with or deal with in, in, in different sorts of ways. So I think one of the things um, that will happen, I think, going forward will be that we will continually turn to uh, genetics um, in good ways and in bad ways. I don't necessarily think that um, you know our, our move to getting genetic answers to things is always the best answer, but it offers us possibilities, particularly for um, communities that aren't able to get ancestry information in other ways. So it offers that possibility. And you know, to follow up on what Levy said, uh, this profound sort of sense of connection. So part of that is about processes of globalization. Part of it is it about technology, as DeRay discussed, but part of it is the way that technology and data come together to really show how we are so related, that more than anything, um, genetics can show us how we're different, but also how um, we are in, in so many ways um, one community, one bigger community, and this question about who we are is both a personal question and an individual question, and also a question about who we imagine ourselves to be as a nation state and as a, as a, a kind of global community as well. Um, Joanna, and, and that's uh, how we can leverage roots as, in terms of a next step for the for the African American community. But um, broadly, in the space of um, of you know of DNA and personalized DNA, what's next? What's going? What's on the horizon for Twenty Three and Me? All right, um, this is a great question for me because ever since I joined Twenty Three and Me, and I joined Twenty Three and Me having spent 
25 years thinking about genetic diversity in Africa. So I joined 23andMe and immediately started reaching out to contacts who study peoples of Africa and throughout the years have worked to expand the set of comparison data. So the way our service works is we look at, well, in an automated way, we look at the DNA of our customers and we compare that DNA, the whole genome, to the DNA of peoples from different parts of the world. And we call those a, re that a reference data set or comparison data set. And the, our ability to pinpoint where somebody's ancestors are from depends on how, you know, well we, you know, you know um, have, represent every part of the world. And so as it's true for ge genetics research in general, um, populations of Africa are underrepresented. And so I've worked, and we hear it from our customers, including uh, Shannon Christmas, who's, who's here in the audience today, who's one of our customers, who pushes us to, to go uh, get more detail for African ancestry. And we do that by projects, um, and we have advisors from Boston University who help us understand where we should go in Africa to obtain um, DNA samples from peoples who are likely to represent the ancestry or may represent the ancestry of peoples in the U.S., African Americans. And fascinatingly, you know, not just African Americans have roots in Africa, but European Americans and Latinos and other, you know, people of other identities have roots that trace back to Africa and are, really want to know more, more details. So it's all about getting more detail for people. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, DeRay, just to wrap up with you and then we'll go out to the, the audience. Um, why is it important for young folks on the front lines today to look back, way back to these um, fascinating but deeply painful times and understand their roots? Why is it important for them to, you know, to, to, to tune into roots, to understand the 77 roots, this version, and their broader story? Why does that matter? How does that impact their lives? Yes, yeah, so I want to push on this idea of the front lines. We don't use that language, or I don't use it in the movement, partly because, like, we would say that all black people are in proximity to the trauma. Just because I was in the middle of the street doesn't mean that I'm... Right, the world's a front line. So, but I do think, you know, I'm mindful of the understanding that we aren't born woke, that something wakes us up, yeah. right? And that this movie could be something that wakes people up. You know, I didn't know the police were killing people like they were until Mike got killed. Like, I just didn't know. And it changed everything for me. And I think that movies like this can help people enter into these conversations in new ways. I'm awful mindful of the difference between being woke and staying woke. Mm. And I think some people get it for two days and then you're like, what happened? You know, so if this movie can be somebody's refresher, if this can keep them woke, I think that that is like an important part of the work. I'm also mindful and worry, and I think a lot of people in the movement space worry about what does it mean that there's a market for these narratives of the pain of blackness, right? That like, there's a market for this in a way that doesn't always talk about them into joy, right? That we are not only our pain, that we have survived and overcome so much, and that has to be rooted in a deep sense of love that is not only love in response to trauma. So how do we create space for that too? Yeah. I think it's like real work that we need to be mindful of uh, because again, there's a market for this. And the flip side to that is that we, some people want us to forget this part of it, right? They want to, they want to say, oh, that was so long ago. And we're like, no, I couldn't stand still in August of 2014. That feels real recent, right? Um, <laughs> so how do we help people like connect these things so they see that this is a continuous line of struggle that shouldn't be content, right? We shouldn't have to be in this place. And we think about remembering is not only recalling, but it is this putting back together, right? Like the remember. And how do we use these things to sort of make blackness whole and talk about identity in new and complex ways? I think about in, in this day and age, we are talking about the transgender community in ways that we have never publicly before. Like this is, in, in movies like this can help create space about the complexity of blackness. And I'm hopeful that that's what, you know, I haven't seen it, I'm here for the screening. So I'm hopeful that that's what this will do, and I'm hopeful that that's the conversations that this will lead to. Can I, can I just, I've seen it, and I think I'm woke, and I saw it, and the visceral reaction that I had, like I was sitting in that theater like, I want to do something right now, and I think I'm already woke. So you are right that this is going to be a film that's gonna wake people up, people who were napping, who were like, we're all good. It elicited a visceral reaction I'm from interested. me. 
Same here. And it's, you know, one of the beautiful things about it is obviously there's deep pain, but there's this thread of resistance that yeah. just goes throughout and just deep yeah. humanity and beauty and love, too. It's not sugarcoating. You'll see that. Yeah. But it, um, and, not, and not to talk too much about it before you see it. But there, that, that spirit of resistance, that fight and that love is there. So let's go out to the audience um, and get some questions about this, these questions of identity and, and roots. And remember, we're going to have another panel with the cast and crew. And so if you have questions for them, we're going to do that in just a little bit. Um, but let, let's uh, raise hands if you have any question. Uh, Ch Chiabaka, uh, a friend from Howard, I wanted to go to you first. Sorry mm -hmm. to put you on the spot because she's a student at Howard that just graduated and was on our panel at, um, at Howard a couple weeks ago and was phenomenal. And so I just want to say, you got, you got any questions for the panel, <laughs> by the way? Give it up for her graduation. Yeah. conversations we're talking a lot about black strength but we're not talking about white fragility that created the context for black strength to exist and be the dominant narrative and a lot of times again we're like tiptoeing around it we're like oh my gosh black people have been through so much why do white people create this context like why are, why are we in a context where we're having these conversations and um the wokeness thing okay i'm just going to go to a question because i'm commenting now um question to you go back to the original thing i said how do you feel about the fact that we keep focusing on black strength which is already a thing, we know it's a thing. Why aren't we talking about the real issues, why fragility, because that's what perpetuates white supremacy and the systems of injustice that exist now. Yeah, what's the flip side of the conversation of strength? And, and uh, yeah, anyone want to take that? And again, that may um, be a question for the, the, um, the cast and crew as well, which, yeah. which we can come back to. But anyone want to Jeff take that? made a great, Jeff Johnson is here. Hey, Jeff. Let's give it up for um, Jeff Johnson. <laughs> at, a, at a discussion that we had about Roots, he made the point of we always talk about slavery in the US as black history, even though it's also white history because the other part were white people who were oppressing black people. And we don't talk enough about that. So when we talk about slavery and we say, hey, this is black history, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice also and not also flipping the coin and then pointing and saying, hey, white people, this is also part of your legacy. So that's in, in terms of when we talk about the conversations that we need to have, if we want to have some real tough conversations, that needs to be a point. Absolutely. And I would say, too, that there is something about how do we, uh, do we have to always center whiteness when we talk about blackness, right? Like, and uh, can we talk about blackness on its own and appreciate that and have that be complex and beautiful without always recognizing the presence of whiteness? Not to ignore it, not to let white people off the hook, right? Like, you, you, you made a system that is destructive and you did that on purpose, right? And there's, there is something specific about that, that the privilege of whiteness is real and it is, damaging to so many people every day. Uh, but I think about the conversations I have about race every day that I am, I get exhausted always having to refer back to whiteness um, and want to be in a space where I can just talk about the beauty and blackness or the pain and blackness or the complexity in it as its own and not only as a referent. Yeah, I want to ask a question to, for the audience. Has, has anyone done either 23andMe or did a careful process to plot your own genealogy and want to share a little bit of your story? Is, is it anyone want to share? Yes, uh, Reverend Lisa Sharon Harper. Yes. Please. Thanks so much uh, for everyone who has, and thank you for producing um, this incredible work. Um, I just my parents and my mom and I actually more than anything else we bond over our DNA. In fact, just last night. I got the results for my 23andMe. <laughs> Last night, I was up looking at it, you know, and I already have the Ancestry.com. Sorry for the competitor mention. <laughs> um, but um, over in, on my mother's birthday on February 21st, uh, we were doing some research on um, on a piece of our of our family lineage that had a a, a a missing link, and so we had the DNA that connected our family, my mom's family. Um, all the way back to a couple um, that were actually a love affair. Um, Sambo Game and, uh, and, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name now. But a, a, an Irish immigrant from in, in 1647, way, way back. So Sambo, yes, there's a real person named Sambo, and he was black. Um, but she was also already married to a black man, and they had Fortune uh, McGee. And Fortune then changed her name after being freed from uh, indentured servitude at 31 to Fortune Fortune. And from that lineage, you actually get um, me, but you also get um, Charlotte uh, Grimke, um, who, uh, or Charlotte, sorry, Charlotte Fortin, who was married to one of the Grimke sisters, 
sons, and it's pretty, it's just incredible how they, how that lineage goes. I do have a question though, can I ask yes. a question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so here's my question. My question is that, um, like our sister here, we were talking about, um, we often get caught talking about blackness as, um, as if it's something real, but it's not. And the thing that's really striking to me about the DNA is that it tells you it's not. That blackness comes from an actual political construct that was meant to do one thing and one thing only. And whiteness the same, to define who <coughs> has power in our society, period. Who has the power to exercise dominion on this land? And so, so the question that I have is, and, and it's, it's not even just an American thing, it's, it's international, it's global. Um, so I, I think the question I have is, does this, does this show, with, will this um, new reiteration actually address that question, the political construct of race? So we can get back to what's real, which is ethnicity. Well, one of the fascinating things about it um, and the, and is about the, uh, the new uh, imagination of roots is that they were able to hold, go a whole lot deeper on the African side of things. And so it may not hit that point directly. And I think in some ways it does. But it, but it shows that there was this whole society that existed that was not a function of race, but was just a flourishing and beautiful society. I, I want to actually go, if you don't uh, mind, to speak a little bit to that, because she helped us on some of the history to the Dr. Dinah Ramey Berry, University of Texas, and a phenomenal historian on, on race and slavery, um, and, and worked with Dr. Kim Gilmore and others on some of this history. There's a lot more nuance in the Africa pieces of this, right? I don't know if you want to, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Is that okay? Can I just um, to speak to that piece a little bit? Yeah. Well, um, just from our research that's been going on over the last 10, 20 years, um, the history of slavery, after the 1990s, there were, there's been a plethora of studies. Um, we're going into communities, we're looking at certain types of cultures, certain types of crops, you know, how enslaved people lived in these different regions, um, what, where they were located, um, we're learning about their culture, we're learning about cultural traditions, and I think that this, um, this, the series that you're going to see will show a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the research that's been done was sort of consulted. We talked about a lot of it with the script. So I think it's going to be a, a place to open up a conversation, perhaps to have deeper conversations about not only African history, but also the culture that goes in curious. <coughs> Absolutely. And, and, and Mark, you, you, you all particularly looked at um, the, a, 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 a deeper dive into some of the Africa pieces as well. Do you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, you know, the original roots did it very differently. They didn't have the research. They didn't have the material. As, as LeVar said earlier, the success of Alex Haley's book in the original mi miniseries actually prompted a lot of research. It was absolutely critical that if I was going to follow in my father's footsteps, that I was going to try to fill in that gap that existed in the original one that we were going to find the history as it reveals itself today to us scientifically and socially today and make sure that it was a part of this this mini series and you know um, our director sitting next to me here um, Ms. Fadley is actually from South Africa it was critically important to him as well and having the historians available a team of historians available every single day to call and say how would this be Tell us 10 things that we don't know that's never been portrayed in film or television again. Be sure that we can surprise the audience with information that they don't know so that they can find this rich history, see this rich history, and live with this rich history was uh, amazingly important. And you know, we were a little worried if the network would let us stay in Africa as long as we wanted to in the story. but. Philip is a very, very large gentleman, and he really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> him to let you stay. <laughs> to, to, to do that, and they embraced it as well. Yeah, the African Mike. portions are so beautiful, um, even down to the color of the cloth. They brought on this, the uh, iconic costume um, designer Ruth Carter, who did you know Malcolm X and Do the Right Thing, and so many others. And you'll see her threads um, weaving the story together uh, from Africa all the way through uh, the plantation. Yes, Alondra. Yeah, I just wanted to say. I've seen a, a portion um, of the the Middle Passage journey on the New Roots, and it's you know it's harrowing and powerful, um, but it also shows the race making technology of domination that you're talking about, right? So you have it, it shows um, you know people packed together 
and the stow of a ship, speaking different languages, have different experiences, and that process and that journey, you know, is part of how race is created as a kind of caste system and category. Um, and I think the 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 um, film, I don't, we film, uh, does a, a, a really good job at showing partic the dynamic, especially that you were talking about. The and in terms of I'm sorry, like the blackness, sorry about that. I I choose to call myself black as a political statement because. I mean, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm African-American, that's great, that's fine. Um, I feel like it's a connection to me and the rest of the diaspora to claim black, and even if it was a social construct, a lot of social constructs become real when they become, money is a social construct, language is too. So after a bit, it does take on some type of power that feels real in terms of consequences. But for me, I choose to, to claim black. The race. <laughs> The race-making technology of the slave ship. What a phrase, my goodness. Um, yes, sorry, question here, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Anidra Edwards. Um, I'm asking this question on behalf of my mother and my aunt, because they're not gonna ask it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you define wokeness and staying woke for the audience, I know they asked it, there's a lot of people that don't know what that means. I did a brief description for them, but I know you all know What is the dictionary definition <laughs> of, of woke? Right, I don't know. Don't don't tweet this. <laughs> Give me <in> trouble. Yeah. <laughs> DeRay's Urban Dictionary. Right, right, right. Give right. right. me in trouble. I, when we talk about woke, it is an acknowledgement and understanding of social justice issues and larger issues in justice or race. So when we say people like uh, staying woke is or getting woke, staying woke is about like, can you, do you understand it and will you do something about it? Is I think the simplest way to say it. So people who we say are woke are people who get it. You know, so for us, for me, I saw 1977, you know, roots, and I saw when I was at Morgan State University as a student. So for us, my generation, we, um, we identified with things like school days. And we said, at the end he said, Wake up. Yeah. That's us. So I think it's a um, equivalent. You gotta pay homage to you guys. Make that then. connection. That was good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she got it. She got it. You Mama know what woke means. You got it. That's good. and also my questions to you all. So I, I guess I started, my name's India Daniels. I went to Howard University, Ooh. went on to Georgia University. And so, um, you know, going to Howard and then going to Georgetown gave me the best of two worlds to see um, social justice and construct because Georgetown is also very passionate about um, civil rights, human rights, that type of thing. Um, and so coming out of that, I you know went on to have a career in human rights and social um, rights and civil rights. And um, I think my journey of being woke uh, started right where you were, D. Ray, in 2014 when I witnessed and saw all of the um, things that were happening in various states, uh, which prompted me to do my own research on my heritage to define who I was. I didn't go get a you know blood sample. I just started doing some research um, and to find out, my great grandmother, uh, she was considered biracial. If you saw her, you'd think she was white. Um, <coughs> she was given land by her slave owner. A majority of Alexandria, Virginia land, um, whereas to now, there's a, there's, a mile mar there's a marker there in Kingstown, Virginia, that says, this is the Carrolltown family. That whole land right there was all of my ancestors who were predominantly mixed of line between slave owner and African American or black or people of color. So that gave me an idea who I, who I was and it made me want to go step deeper. And then I learned that my, on my grandfather's side, his mother was a full-blooded Indian and you know wore the, so I didn't know who I was, so to speak. It left me feeling um, very confused, very, Am I black? Am I Indian? Am I white? It left me feeling very, very confused and very hurt. So I guess that made me wake up and stay woke. But the real issue that I am seeing in our 
and now our generation is not necessarily um, staying woke, but being educated about these issues. Um, a lot of our people are not aware. And when I say our people, I'm talking anywhere between the ages of 18 and about 35. They're not aware of the injustice. And injustice doesn't look like slavery like Roots does today. It looks like systemic racial <coughs> discrimination. Discrimination in housing, discrimination in employment, discrimination in therapy, discrimination in medical. <coughs> and they don't know that. And they're not aware of it. Um, so my question would be, how do we address the current generation with the new type of enslavement? How do we address that to our new generation who has no clue, quite frankly? They don't know, and I know this because I poll people on Facebook and on social media. They have no idea of what our society is going through. Um, how, do we, how do we address that? That's, that's a great question, and, and, and I think the, you know, the, the, the core piece that we'd love for you to, to reflect on is um, how do we take these big, overwhelming issues and not necessarily make them palatable because by nature they're not palatable, but how do we make, how do we make uh, it so that people can actually do something and understand because they can be overwhelming, all these data points and your history and your culture and the news, and it, it feels overwhelming at, at times. How, how, how do you do that? Yeah. One, I want to actually push back on the narrative that 18 to 35 year olds don't know what's going on. I feel like it's a prevailing thing that's been happening. Millennials don't really know what's going on. Millennials aren't doing anything. I'm like on an older version of the millennial. I don't really claim some of the 25 and unders. <laughs> but <laughs> I still have to give them credit. You know, groups like Dream Defenders, Black Youth Project 100, United We Dream, there are people who are younger, who are paying attention and plugged in. So I don't want us to run with the idea that younger people have absolutely no idea what's going on. They're paying attention. Sometimes what happens is not knowing what to do then makes them not do anything. So in terms of what we can do, things like what D-Ray's doing, using his Twitter account to pass on information and making sure he's the intermediary between the news, whatever they have going on, and the actual storytellers who are on the ground. But also giving them actual call to actions. Do you want them to come to the corner at four o'clock? Cool, tell them that. Don't just be like, do something. What does that look like? So giving direction and pointing them towards people who are their age who are already doing things and organizations like BYP 100 and saying, if you don't know what to do, join this organization. They will tell you what to do and where to show up for the action. And like BYP shut down, they got a, an officer fired in Chicago for killing somebody just by standing strong at a community meeting. So please don't think this generation is not doing anything because they are working. And you can also do it, and this is what Lovey and, and DeRay and others do so beautifully, you can do it with humor and with fashion and with style and with swag. I mean, that, you know, I, I won't repeat some of what Lovey has posted over the last few days. Um, it's not all uh, about roots and, gene and ancestry, but it's funny. And so because she's able to seed um, the, uh, the humor into these broader and deeper and more complex conversations, it makes it um, a little bit more actionable for this current generation. DeRay, yeah. And I, I think you name, so I agree with much of what Lovey said, and I think you name something that is real, that there is, we live in a time where there's so much content that, that things can get lost in a different way. I think about, I had to watch Roots because Nanny was like, everybody's watching Roots. And it's like, okay, Nanny, right? There was no internet, there was no YouTube, like we weren't, that wasn't an option. We had to watch it because it was the only thing that was on TV that night. Um, and we, that's a different, that doesn't exist anymore in the same way. And we I think still that's, have to watch Roots, though. Right, we, <laughs> but that's just, and I think that's real. I also think that there are many people who want to be in the work but don't know what that means, right? They, they like want to fight, but they don't want to be a member of something. So how do we organize those people? I think it's like a real, I think that's like real work that has to happen. And I'll tell you, know, I think everybody, you can be a protester, right? Like if people understand protest is telling the truth in public, there are many ways to do that. And I've seen people try and opt out out of the work because they're like, I can't come sit in the street. It's like, well, go, if you know the governor, go straight to his house, right? Like skip the street, go straight to that. Like there are many ways for you to be in this work. And I think about artists, I think about Anika Nanioru is like, I, I know you from Twitter, right? Like we go back and forth on Twitter. It's the first time I've seen her in person, but it is important that people who 
who are storytellers in different ways, artists, like using these platforms to invite people into these conversations, like that is important. And you have modeled what I think the work actually is, is this idea that like you can, you are enough to start a movement, like you can do it. You can like get people, all this work starts from people identifying a problem saying, I think we can do something about it and then finding people who believe that too. Like that was Ferguson. It wasn't one, two, three people. It was no organization started it. It was people saw Mike's body in the street for four and a half hours and were like, this ain't it. And they're like, we're going to come outside. We're going to come outside today and tomorrow, tear gas or what? We're going to be here again, right? And like, that was it. That started it. And we like built the infrastructure around the space, but it didn't take an organization to do that. It took people who were committed and it took people saying, here's what I think my role is, right? I was one of the tweeters. There were people who were live streamers. There were people like Feminista Jones who from afar supported us, right? There are people like Jeff who supported us and we never met them before, but like we built community. And some of this isn't rocket, like it literally is like, I think there's a problem, I think we can do something and let me find people who believe that too. And like, that is what the work is. And I think that over the last 19 months, I worry that people, there are these myths of like, you know, this organization did the, and you're like, it was people who saw a problem, got together and did something. And like, we did a lot of things that you didn't see on TV because they didn't work. But we did a lot of cool things that you did see. I think about some protests and we we did, there was this chant back in the day that we don't use anymore that's, uh, they think it's a game, they think it's a joke. And we shut down this one intersection by playing games and the police didn't know what to do. You know, people, like 50 year old white women are like jump rope and we're playing monkey in the middle and the police are like, they just don't know, right? And we're like, we know you're not gonna lock up the 50 year white woman jump roping, but like that was us being like, let's figure out a different way to be in this space to like confront people with this issue. And I think that like that is the work at the end of the day. And a couple of beautiful things about that. First, it was a broad coalition of people out there, right? You know, uh, both African Americans, but also allies coming alongside this um, uh, the, the, that, that challenge and that continued challenge. And I think that's going to be the case with Roots as well. This is a black story, but as you said, it's also a story for a whole lot of people that you will see themselves um, in, in these narratives reflected. Um, and so on May 30th, I think we're going to have a new community forming around this for um, four nights and hopefully beyond that as well. We're going to um, begin to wrap up our panel, but we have a very special, special, special presentation. And by the way, we're going to have a second panel uh, this this afternoon with the cast and and crew and some amazing people. So save your questions. But um, this is not the only tool for finding out who you are and your family story, but History Channel, A plus C Networks, and 23andMe did want to give you a very important tool. And so for everyone here uh, uh, today um, who does not already have one, if you have one, uh, please don't pick one up because we want to make sure we have enough to go around. 23andMe and, and History are actually providing you with a DNA kit that you can use. Yeah. I need to um, so I, I'm going to ask Dr. Joanna Mountain to explain what is in this box because it's a very, very important box. I need to box. do one. Uh, it's, it's, it's maybe she could tell us. Uh, let me open it up for you. Or, yeah. She could tell us what's in. I, I can open it up. For you. So, isn't that exciting? By the way, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get. It. I'm excited for you, and because every time I open up one of these boxes. Well, first of all, I think, oh my goodness, is this like a lab? You know, there's a test tube in here. Am I going to screw it up? But so, it's the instructions are all inside. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Step one: open up the box, or get a friend to open up the box. And the key thing, because um, this is all very anonymous, in that. There's a barcode on the tube, and we need to connect that barcode to you through a process called registration. So there's a key step here is to register the kit so that you know, when your saliva makes it to the laboratory and the results, you know, your, your DNA results are connected, and you can, in six or eight weeks, you'll be invited to log on to your 23andMe account and explore your DNA. And I, I personally recommend going to the report section on ancestry and one of the tools called DNA relatives. So those are the things I work on, but you know, I think they're very valuable in this context. So that's the um, basics of, of the kit. Register.
No pressure. You don't have to take one. Please don't take more than one. If you've already had one, don't take one. So those are the basic rules. Angela from Howard, you just did one, right? Did you just do a kit? How was that experience? Pretty easy? Um, yeah, I just took it. I haven't got my results yet. But it was really simple. It was very great. I'm very humbled <coughs> to see what it is. Yeah. Um, it was a great experience. Very, very nice. So, okay, so Angela has done it. Anika, you, you've done a 23andMe kit. Is that right? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, you don't have to share your results unless you want to, but what was the experience like? Yeah. I thought it was very cool. I mean, basically, you, <coughs> spit, you spit yourself dry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as easy as it is. You're not like sticking your finger or anything. It's very, very simple and painless. Um, my results came fairly quickly, I think, because of roots. But it was also very interesting to me because there are things. I'm an actor. I, I have voice now. <laughs> there are um, there are things about my family that I know to be true because I've seen photographs that did not show up. So that was very very. And I have a whole portion of my family that are Blackfeet Indians, but when I with photos of them and everything, and when I got my results back, there was only two percent of them represented in my blood, but a lot of Europeans. So I think that probably they were quite diluted, not diluted, but diluted, um, you know, by the time we got to that place in the line with European lineage as well. So that was very interesting to me, how much Irish and British I actually have. If I could just add uh, about your point, um, you know, what the results can be is what's in the reference database. And so it may not be the case that there was sufficient you know, a high enough sample of Native American DNA um, in the database to give you a higher result. So um, you shouldn't necessarily interpret that as saying that you don't have the Blackfoot Indian, you know, ancestry that you think you have. You may not, I don't know, but, um, you know, the, the point that um, Joanna raised in the beginning about having to have bigger and more robust reference database, this is how that happens, and I, I suspect that many of the samples that you will give when you participate in this will become part of that reference database as well, so people should know that It's as well. really, really interesting, too, just on the point of being a black American and what that is, and this young woman's confusion here when she got her family tree, I think that when we talk about being black Americans, we are Americans. And what that means to be a black American intrinsically is to be mixed. So everything that we learn about, every Greek in our tree, every Brit, every Irishman, it's who we are. It is what makes us black Americans. The code was put on us, the name was put on us, but we are Americans. And that is the thing that is who we are. And, and all of this, Come through. thank you. All of this will come together so beautifully on what date? May 30th. May 30th. Friends, this is going to be an, a new community forming around this, not just for those four nights, but into the future. Please tune in. Please watch. You're going to get a sneak preview this hashtag? afternoon. Um, hashtag roots. Thank you. Hashtag roots. Um, you're going to get a, a beautiful sneak preview this afternoon, but watch it again on the 30th, and please spread the word far and wide. We have, as you're hearing from this panel, an opportunity to go deeper into so many areas, into DNA, gene genealogy, social justice, um, and it starts on May 30th. So let's give a warm round of applause to our panel.